Well, hello and welcome. Uh, tonight we continue our Earth Day series at focusing on some of the conservation heroes uh, we have here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we will be viewing Myra Lloyd Dock, A Beautiful Crusade. Um, after the viewing, we have three distinguished panelists um, that we will be asking some questions of. And we also invite you, the viewer, to post your questions in the chat box um, on whatever platform you're looking at, either through YouTube or on our Facebook page. And we'll try to answer those questions by presenting them to the viewers, to the uh, panelists. My name is Marcy Mowry, and I am the president of the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation. And I'm briefly gonna interview each of our panelists and I will int introduce them again after the show. So we have Ellen Schultzeberger. Uh, she is the state forester for Pennsylvania. Ellen? Hi. Uh, Great, and Craig Houghton. Craig is an assistant professor of forestry at Penn State Mon Alto. Hello. And we have Kyle Shank, who is the Pennsylvania State Director for the Conservation Fund. Kyle. Good evening, everyone. Excellent. So welcome, we're, we're very excited to share with you um, Myra Lloyd Dock, A Beautiful Crusade. Myra was an almost forgotten um, champion of conservation in the early part of the last century. And her legacy has only recently been um, reinvigorated and we are excited to be able to connect people to her work because she did a lot of amazing things at a time when um, women weren't actively engaged in politics. So um, one of the things that I really like about her is the, the leadership that she showed. So as you watch the documentary, think about Myra from a leadership perspective, think about Myra and from the perspective of how uh, she may have influenced your life. And also think about her from the perspective of what she contributed to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So if you give me a moment here, I am going to share the screen so that we can all enjoy watching uh, Myra Lloyd Dock, A Beautiful Crusade. And I would ask the panelists if you would uh, mi mute your microphones and we will go live here in just a moment. In 1899, women were seen, not heard, but not Myra Lloyd Dock, a little known progressive era activist. This botanist, forester, and conservationist brought the city beautiful movement to Pennsylvania's capital city. She helped transform it from a grimy, disease-ridden mess to a cleanly manicured and modern state capital. During Myra's 12 years of service on the Pennsylvania Forest Commission, one million acres of forest became reserves. She was the first woman in the world to be appointed to a public forest commission, and she was the first woman to hold a job in Pennsylvania government, either appointed or elected. I think she shows what we can do as communities when we work together. She was constantly, you know, just finding where her expertise and her great knowledge would help and benefit the people that she lived near and the people that she was grooming to become the foresters of the future because of her love for botany and wanting to bring the forest to the people, properly modified, intended, and cared for. That was her heart wish. She was a progressive in that day and age to have a woman attain the academic credentials that she did, the travel to the extent that she did, that had the kind of impact she did in pretty much a male dominated society really means a lot. She was ahead of her time in understanding sustainability. Huge for her own city. You know, we can't live like this and continue to be healthy and happy. We have to live in a sustainable way. And same with our forests. You have to keep planting. You have to keep planting. <laughs> you know, that was, I think that's what she would say. Major funding for Myra Lloyd Dock, A Beautiful Crusade, is provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Heinz Endowments, the William Penn Foundation, the Pennsylvania Parks and Forests Foundation, the Pennsylvania Conservation Heritage Committee, 
and by viewers like you. Thank you. Myra Lloyd Dock was the oldest of six children. She was born on Christmas Day in 1853 in Upper Dauphin County. Her father, Jilliard Dock, was superintendent of a coal company, and her mother, Lavinia, delighted in taking care of the children. They loved the outdoors. They could identify trees and birds. They had a garden. They grew their own vegetables. An uncle wrote once uh, to a friend of his that at my brother Jilliard's place, there are more rattlesnakes than any place I've ever been, but it doesn't seem to bother the children. They don't get bitten. Her father seemed to have a big influence here. He himself had been a traveler. To, he would, went to the west, to Colorado, to enjoy the mountains. And he said there's something about the mountains that takes possession of one. He then also sent his daughter, Myra, to Colorado herself, and he told her to pick all the wildflowers she can and a sprig of sage, become fat and hearty, and let no one trespass on your personal dignity. So he was giving her all this permission, which I think daughters often do need permission from their fathers, particularly to step outside what culture asks them to do and be. And he was saying, do it, you know, be strong and be yourself and don't let anyone trespass on that. When she was 10 years old, the family moved to Harrisburg, seeking better educational opportunities for the children. As Myra came of age in the mid to late 1800s, she was surrounded by industrialization. Cities were growing rapidly and often haphazardly. There was no such thing as urban planning. And so she certainly saw as a child Harrisburg getting larger and more diverse and perhaps more confused. And cities didn't enjoy any of the amenities we have today. There was no public sewage or water. There was no drainage. Immigration was changing from uh, Northern and Western Europe to Eastern and Southern European Europe. So there would have been new people coming into Harrisburg, new ethnic groups, new religions, new cultures and customs. The feminist movement was beginning to get more vocal. Women throughout the world were demanding their rights, particularly their right to vote. And finally, as industrialization and urbanization take off um, and we begin to use more resources, people become concerned about conservation. If we use it all up now, what will be left for the next generation? So I think those were all trends that influenced Doc as she was growing up. Tragedy struck the Doc family in 1876 when their mother died at age 44. Myra found herself thrust into the role of caretaker. She was 23 years old, not very old. The youngest child was seven. So she had a big job of raising that family. Then her father took ill and she nursed him through his last illnesses. So. Doc had caretaking responsibilities from the 1870s up to 1893. While you're raising children, if, that's, if that is the number one priority, there still could be something within that's, that needs attention. And for Myra, there was. And it was important because it led to the next step. This study of botany. She wanted to be a scientist. She said in one of her diaries that to be in a laboratory with a microscope was her dream of joy. I mean, that says it all. And now her younger brother steps in, George, professor at the University of Michigan, opened some doors for her so that she could go and study botany at the University of Michigan. So now she could be in a laboratory and now she could have her dream of joy. She stayed two years, but she never took a degree. The reason I don't think she stayed to finish a degree was she realized, given the discrimination against women at that time, she was never going to be able to work in a laboratory. What she could do with her botany work was become a public lecturer and support herself that way. Doc came back to Harrisburg in 1895 printed up some flyers and some business cards and began to advertise herself as a professional lecturer. And she was able to talk on a wide variety of topics related to botany. 
in the early years, her talk might be about ferns or it might be about magnolias or about the procession of the leaf starting from the bud to the fall from the tree, you know, very poetic and very instructive as a botanist teacher might present this. She had all her lantern slides to illustrate and all these beautiful things. She advertised her lectures with or without glass lantern slides, which she took herself. And she commanded $50 a lecture, which today that doesn't seem like a lot of money. However, in those days, teachers in school earned $350 a year. And she was very successful in a very short time. She lectured throughout Pennsylvania, uh, from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, from Harrisburg to Williamsport. And uh, as her talent and her reputation grew, she began to lecture in surrounding states as well. In 1899, four years into her lecturing career, Doc traveled to London to attend the International Congress of Women, convened by the International Council of Women. There, she learned about the women's suffrage movement and attended sessions on botany, agriculture, and horticulture. She also toured English cities to see what they did in the way of municipal improvements, including roads and sanitation, as well as parks and amusements for the working class. From there, she went to Germany and also toured German cities, looking for the same thing. And while she was in Germany, she took a letter of introduction from her good friend Gifford Pinchot, to German's preeminent forester, Sir Dietrich Brandes. And she said to him, I am interested in forestry. My friend Gifford Pinchot has recommended that I come to see you while I'm on the continent, and I would willingly pay you for forestry lessons. Sir Dietrich said, I'm not in the habit of taking money from ladies, and I would share my knowledge with you for free. But I think a better course of action would be for you to take a tour of the Black Forest. I can arrange tours for you with the various foresters throughout the region. They will teach you what they know, and in a few weeks' time, you will have had a very practical course on forestry. So that's what Doc did. Doc came back to the United States in the fall of 1899 and wrote a pamphlet titled A Summer's Work Abroad. In it, she described what Europeans were doing to beautify their cities, to conserve forests, and to conserve both their natural and human resources. One of the points she made was that people who were property owners in Europe willingly paid money for things like garbage collection, municipal water, municipal sanitation, parks, paved streets, tree-lined streets, because they felt that was a good investment in their community, that was good for the people, and that fostered economic growth. And she wanted to share that with the people of Pennsylvania. She came back and said, we are missing the boat here, Harrisburg. We have a big mess. There were two paved streets in the whole city. Pigs ran around the city rooting in the streets because people threw their garbage there. And the other place people liked to throw their garbage was along the banks of the Susquehanna River. Most people did not have indoor plumbing, so they had outhouses in the backyard. And you can imagine how they backed up after a couple of months of use and how they smelled about August uh, each year. Uh, there was no flood control. The uh, Susquehanna flooded after every heavy rainstorm, and so did Paxton Creek. The water was not sanitized, so combined with the backed up outhouses, your water's contaminated, and there were periodic outbreaks of typhoid fever in Harrisburg due to the poor sanitation. Conditions were so bad, Governor William Stone was quoted in the Harrisburg Telegraph newspaper as saying, Let your bathtub run full of city water any morning without filtering it and look at it. You might as well go down to the tannery and bathe in a vat. This was not so much, we need to improve our capital city, but first of all, we need to have a decent environment for all of our citizens, and particularly a legacy for our children. Look what they do in Germany and, and other European countries. They actually have parks. <laughs> they actually put a high priority on public space. Look how clean it is. 
Myra was an important catalyst and helped launch the City Beautiful movement in Harrisburg. She passionately lectured throughout the city using a kerosene burning lantern, projecting slides depicting beautiful European cities and natural forests juxtaposed with slides depicting a dirty and unhealthy Harrisburg. She spoke to the ladies at the Harrisburg Civic Club, an organization she helped found. Myra promoted the idea that public parks were not only beautiful, they could also contribute to the overall health of the city and boost economic development. Doc's experience and credentials helped build her audience and eventually attracted even the men. She had a strong ally in J. Horace McFarland, a prominent Harrisburg printer, businessman, and a member of the Board of Trade. McFarland approached Doc with an idea. He said, I'd love an invitation to come talk to the Civic Club and I will point the finger of scorn. I will show them lantern slides showing all the garbage dumped on the banks of the Susquehanna River. And at the same time, I can get you an invitation to lecture for the Board of Trade. Similar to our Chamber of Commerce today, all men, doctors, lawyers, businessmen, and so forth. Normally, you don't invite women to talk there. In December 20th, 1900, she gave a lecture there. She relied on all her past experience of what brings an audience in. And you don't bring someone in by shaking your finger at them right off the top. That was her charm. They said that she had charm. She started by showing her slides that she took in Germany, the river fronts, you know, the streets, the parks and so forth. Oh, and the audience, they would applaud. Oh, beautiful, wonderful travelogue. Then she started to slip in pictures of what the riverfront looked like in Harrisburg, the streets and so forth. The applause stopped. The men got the message. After that speech of the Board of Trade, they got it. J. Horace McFarland said that there was a hush of comprehension and then applause. Newspapers picked up the story of Myra's inspiring lecture and began publishing articles in support of a comprehensive plan, including a bond issue needed to make improvements to the city's infrastructure and park systems. In order to make a real change, two things needed to happen. The bond issue needed to be put to a referendum for residents to vote on, and it was going to cost money, just over $1 million. The thing about the Harrisburg City Beautiful movement, and this is really the first time a medium-sized city takes on this kind of project, passes this kind of bond issue with overwhelming support. The bond issue passed in all but one city ward and then puts into place a comprehensive plan of improvement. And Harrisburg City Beautiful model became the model for many other small and medium-sized cities in the United States. City Beautiful had a huge impact on Harrisburg. From 1900 into the 1920s, the city saw the creation of parks and improved infrastructure and utilities. One of the most important results of the wave of improvement was the creation of a ring of parks around the city, which Myra referred to as the Emerald Necklace. It provided residents easy access to open green space, and Myra Lloyd Dock helped make it all happen. Today, her legacy lives on at Reservoir Park, along the Capital Area Greenbelt and Wildwood Park. In Harrisburg, we have an organization, City Beautiful 2.0, which is a civic-based, community-based collection of organizations, inspired in many ways by the work of Myra Lloyd Dock. And what we're trying to do is keep the spirit of the original City Beautiful movement alive. Through Doc's work with the Pennsylvania Forestry Association, she met Dr. Joseph Rothrock, physician, conservationist, and father of the state forest system. An Arctic explorer, a medical doctor, just he was, must have been brilliant. And she recognized that and she built a relationship with him. She was completely inspired by him. He was probably her most inspiring person to, for the next level of purpose and mission. 
The Pennsylvania State Legislature established the Pennsylvania Forest Commission in 1896. The charge of the Forest Commission was to purchase cutover lands and reforest them. It was a five-member board, and all the commissioners were male. Joseph Rothrock was the chief forest commissioner. The others reported to him. In 1901, it was rumored that one of the original commissioners was going to retire. He was an older man in poor health, and Doc very much wanted to be appointed. And Rothrock spoke up for her. So in 1901, Governor William A. Stone appointed her to the Pennsylvania State Forest Commission. She was the first woman in the world to be appointed to any public forest commission, and she was uh, the first woman to hold any official job in Pennsylvania government, either appointed or elected. What I love about Myra is she was true to herself, first woman to ever sit on a, on a state board. I don't think any of that was easy. When she started on as a commissioner, she said to Joseph Brothrock, I want my name listed on the letterhead as M.L. Doc. Initials, not my name, because I want to make sure people take me seriously. This Forest Commission was brand new. They were feeling their way in the dark, so to speak. Um, these were progressive-minded individuals, and I think they were very happy to have whoever was knowledgeable on the commission, regardless of gender. It didn't take long for Myra to fully immerse herself in the work of the commission. Of all the forest commissioners, she was the one that seemed to be the most likely to go out on the road, out to the forest preserves, to actually see what was going on and then report back to the rest. Since there were no foresters or rangers to do the inspections of the land to be purchased, the work fell mainly on Doc's shoulders. Dr. Joseph Rothrock was the chairperson, but he was very busy with other things. So whenever a track of land came up for sale, it's Myra that went out, took a look at it, and then made a recommendation to purchase it. That meant traveling by train to the closest town, then taking horse and buggy to the sites and inspecting the land on foot. Doc's findings were reported at the next commission meeting, and a vote was taken as to whether or not to buy the land. Over 175,000 acres were added during Doc's first year in office, and by the time she retired from the commission, forest reserves totaled almost one million acres. One of the things she said very quickly to Rothrock, and he agreed, was, we can't enforce policy if we don't have trained foresters and rangers. So if there's no school in Pennsylvania where they can get that education, we have to start one. So the Forest Commission went to the governor and said, we would like state appropriation to establish a Pennsylvania State Forest Academy to train foresters and rangers. The State General Assembly appropriated money in 1902, and a year later, the Forest Commission started the State Forestry Academy, which would later become the Penn State Mont Alto campus. It was the second forestry school in the United States and the first in Pennsylvania. You had to be a Pennsylvania resident. You had to be male. Those young men studied at first a two and later a three-year curriculum. It was an academic college curriculum that included forestry subjects. They took German as well because Doc felt the best forest uh, articles in the world at that time were written in German, not English, and she wanted the young men to read them. Uh, they did summer work at the various forest reserves, and when they graduated, they were employed by the Pennsylvania State Forest Academy throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Doc not only helped found the academy, she also taught and gave lectures in botany using her own textbook she'd written. In 1903, Myra and her sisters moved from Harrisburg to just outside Chambersburg so she could be closer to the school. They bought a property there, they, they built a house, and Myra planted a lot of trees. She would, would walk around the mountains down there with white pine and just plant. Just she'd just take a whole plant. She was like Johnny Appleseed, you know, with white pine. Just picture her carrying her satchel full of these little seedlings. And I picture her growing these things from, from seeds. I mean, she just did it all, you know, from the beginning to the end, and then tromping, tromping, tromping the hills. And, um, you know, I think that's hard work that she loved. 
And then she demonstrated to the forestry students, you know, just what it takes. She loved the young men at the Forest Academy. She wrote them get well notes when they were ill. She uh, sent them fruit baskets in the hospital. She chaperoned their dances. Uh, and the young men found out if they rode their horses over to the dock farm around Sunday dinner time, they'd get invited to stay. They would ride up to Myra's house. Myra would bake cookies and serve milk and they would talk shop. And Myra had a lot of respect for the students. And I, I you know, she cared about them. After 12 years of service on the commission, Myra decided to step down. At the October 3rd, 1913 Commission meeting, Joseph Rothrock introduced a resolution which was unanimously approved by the Commission. Whereas Miss Myra Lloyd Dock, our honored associate in forestry work of the state, after 12 years of faithful, productive effort, has felt obliged to decline longer service, therefore be it resolved that Miss Dock's withdrawal from the State Forestry Reservation Commission is a cause of great regret to the members of the commission who have been so long and so closely associated with her. Resolved that we seriously feel her absence. The best quote I've read came from Enos Mills, who was the U.S. Chief Forester after President Taft fired Gifford Pinchot. And Enos Mills said in an article he wrote for the General Federation of Women's Clubs newsletter, Myra Lloyd Dock did more for forests than any woman in the United States. I'm thinking back to when I discovered her, I asked my colleagues in forestry, you know, you know Myra Dock? Never heard of her. She was this important woman in forestry and I had never heard of her. This was a, a woman that was living in a difficult time you know, for women, they didn't get the credit for uh, anything they did. We take a lot of things for granted in this world. She's a perfect example of progressive era reform in the United States. She's not wealthy. She's not prominent. She's not well known. And she's a woman. And yet she accomplishes quite a bit in one lifetime. And I think she's a great example of the power of one voice. I would like to see Pennsylvania textbooks have Myra Dock in them and her with her white pines planting them all over the state of Pennsylvania. And her legacy will be that every person will see that despite their cultural confines, which for her were formidable, they can have a voice, make a difference, they can follow their passion, that's her legacy. Major funding for Myra Lloyd Dock, A Beautiful Crusade, is provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the Heinz Endowments, the William Penn Foundation, the Pennsylvania Parks and Forests Foundation, the Pennsylvania Conservation Heritage Committee, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Well, welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed learning a little bit more about Myra Lloyd Dock. Um, she, every time I see that documentary, I get very excited because she was just such an amazing woman with such a vision and foresight and power in such a compact form. I love the picture of her standing with all the, all the men and she's up to here on them. She's just a little, little dynamite. Um, so again, my name is Marcy Mowry. I am the uh, president of the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation. I, we are also involved with the Pennsylvania Conservation Heritage Project, um, which helped to fund the documentary that you just saw. With me today, we have Ellen Schultzeberger. She is the state forester for Pennsylvania. We have Kyle Shank. Uh, he is the Pennsylvania State Director for the Conservation Fund. And we have Craig Houghton, Assistant Professor at Penn State Mon Alto. So I'm going to ask them to take themselves off mute. Um, I'm going to ask them a few questions. And I invite you to also um, 
post any questions that, that you might have and I will relay them to the panelist. So panel, this is for all of you. Um, we talked a little bit before the documentary began that Myra's legacy was mostly forgotten, despite the fact that we all today benefit um, from the work that she did. Each of you represent a different aspect of her legacy and of her life. And I'd like you, if you could talk on the topic of how is it that her, her legacy is alive today and how has Myra's work inspired you? So Ellen, why don't we start with you? <laughs> okay, great. Um, well, there's a lot there, so I might give one answer. Um, of course, I can't, I can't talk about Myra without talking about being inspired by the fact that she was, um, you know, working a hundred years ago before women could vote, before they were holding public office having limited opportunities, she was out there influencing people and influencing political processes. Um, so as the first state female, uh, as the first Pennsylvania female state forester, you know, certainly that is inspiring to me. And knowing that, you know, she was working very hard and, and hearing that story of her signing the ML doc and then, you know, kind of moving to the Myra Lloyd doc, uh, I can understand that, you know, when I started in this field, there were certainly a lot less women and you try to quote fit in, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's women like her and, and also the men and, that, uh, helped pave the way for me and many women in forestry and natural resources. So, um, certainly that is something that's inspiring for me and I can't, it's something that, that means a lot and means a lot to probably a lot of women in our field. Yeah, ex absolutely. And do you sign your name, Ellen, or do you do you use a? Uh, <laughs> Ellen. Yep, yep, yep. Great. yep. Great. So we've come a long way. <laughs> Kyle, how yeah, about you? Thank, yeah, thank you, Marcy. Um, so the legacy is uh, alive for me today in one very tangible way, and that I'm coming to you from the historic Calder Mansion. Uh, right on Front Street in Harrisburg, and I can look out the window and look right uh, at the Capillary Greenbelt Riverfront Park and the Susquehanna River, which uh, has come a long way since the lantern slides that we saw in the documentary. Uh, and so it's really uh, fulfilling to see that every day and to see people out um, using it for recreation and transportation, biking, walking. Uh, it's really a, a fantastic thing to see. Um, and uh, her, her work sort of lives on with a lot of the work that, that I do today. Um, uh, many years ago, I was the, involved with the Capital Area Greenbelt Association, uh, which is a phenomenal organization here in Harrisburg that is an all-volunteer group that works to fund, maintain, and improve the Capital Area Greenbelt system, um, including many of the parks that were uh, set up and designed as part of the City Beautiful movement. Um, and then as part of my work at the Conservation Fund, I can definitely relate to uh, Myra's work traveling the state. Uh, a lot of my job is uh, to go and look for ac conservation acquisitions that will become public lands, uh, that will become protected forests and open to the public. And uh, while I don't travel by horse and buggy quite as much uh, anymore, I can certainly connect with, with some of her work there. Um, I, I draw inspiration, I think, from, from her and her work in two really key areas. One is just the importance of sharing your passion and your knowledge um, and your experiences with others that make sure to have a positive impact. Um, and that goes for whether you're involved in conservation or anything else, um, just having the confidence uh, to, to bring your voice out to help make the world a better place with your experiences, I think is something we should all uh, aspire to. On the other side of that, uh, I also see, you know, from a leadership perspective, looking at um, the importance of listening to voices that are potentially uh, non-traditional voices uh, within the dominant culture of whatever issue you happen to be surrounding. Um, you know, in this case, uh, we would have missed out on huge improvements in the city of Harrisburg and the conservation movement um, if Myra had uh, let the fact that women were not prominent uh, hold her back, um, or if they, if she was discriminated against and not been able to to do what she did, uh, and so the importance of listening to those voices that that might not be at the table, uh, I think this is a perfect 
example of, of what we could be missing out on. Great, thank you, Kyle. Craig, would you like me to repeat the question or do you? Because Craig is frozen. Craig? I think he's frozen. <laughs> there he is. Craig, we're having trouble. You're, you're not coming through very well. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to another question, and when you come through, Craig, we'll we'll give the floor to you. So, Kyle, you, you, can, oh, sorry, can I can I add another legacy? Sure. Um, so, one of the ways that certainly we are keeping her legacy going here in the Bureau of Forestry is um, we have a nursery. So. Um, you know, as they said in the video, she's a botanist. She lectured on trees and plants and she championed reforestation. So, and, and I think I also read a story that she liked to grow um, plants from seed and she encouraged kids to do so as well. But so with support from partners and um, other folks in the forestry field, we honored um, Myra's achievements by renaming our Penn Nursery and Woodshop to the Myra Lloyd Doc Resource Conservation Center. We did that maybe uh, three or four years ago in 2016. And, you know, there's a lot of history with that uh, nursery. It was it was created back in 1908 after William Penn. And it was an old potato patch. And it started out as, as a source of seedlings, you know, being able to replant those areas that you saw in the videos that, uh, you know, lacked any trees and had soil problems. And today, you know, we are propagating trees and shrub seedlings uh, and reforesting the state forest lands and, and improving wildlife habitat. We select and harvest and collect uh, millions of seeds from, from the trees, shrubs and orchards. Um, and, you know, one of the big goals is maintaining genetic diversity and health of those trees. So it seemed like a very fitting legacy for a woman who fought against the de degradation of our streams and the soils and fought for restoring and reforesting Pennsylvania. So uh, this Myra Lloyd Doc Resource Conservation Center, not a short name, but okay. it serves it as a testament uh, to the past while literally growing the seedlings for our future. So that is a big way that, you know, we every day and, and we even put things on our um, uh, picnic tables that show and, and keep her name going. And that was important to us. Uh, Alan, before before we go back to Craig, but although I think he might be frozen mm -hmm. again. Um, so pub, there was a question, can the public visit the nursery? Sure, they can visit the nursery and we have a nice little, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Lobby where you can see some historic pieces. Um, not right now though, during this COVID stay at home <laughs> order, but you know, someday. Um, while we're waiting for Craig to come back, we have have another question. Is, is there a way for the public to get involved with the state's nursery as far as care for seedlings, saplings, et cetera? Yep, so we do have a volunteer program and, and um, Annetta Ayers is our nursery manager and we can we can get you connected and um, uh, there is there's a lot of work and help and um, fun stuff that can be done at the nursery. So for sure we can connect you there. Great. Craig, are you with us? Can we can we unmute you and maybe just hear you speaking, even if your video is not working? No. Try again, Craig. I'm going to pose, a, pose another question. Are you there? Well, this is a pity. Because he represents the Monato School of Forestry, which Myra helped to found. So it's a, there's a great connection between what Craig does now and, and Myra's legacy. Um, there was a quote in the documentary that said uh, Myra wasn't wealthy. She um, was not prominent. She was not well known. But she had a tremendous influence. And Kyle, you kind of alluded to this in, 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 as part of your statement. But, you know, why did you think she had such influence? Um, despite the fact that she had these obstacles and she wasn't wealthy, prominent, or well-known. So either one of you. 
are you all frozen now? No, I'm <laughs> Don't oh, do that to me. <laughs> We're just holding really still. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why am, am I? I'm on. I think he deferred to you. Oh, want to ruminate on it? Why do you think yeah, she I'll had such a on that one. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it seems to me, and I think you touched on it as well, Marcy. I mean, it's just a lot of it was sort of the well, the grit and the determination to to get her voice out there and to be heard. Um, you know, another thing that wasn't explicitly mentioned in the documentary, but it seemed like she really knew how to work and leverage uh, her network and her relationships with other people um, to sort of get uh, into areas where she might otherwise not have access. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, being able to get in front of the right people and be able to tell her story uh, to, you know, the, the businessmen of Harrisburg uh, that had the means to uh, implement her vision um, and being able to uh, sort of get into that place and make her voice heard, uh, I think really helped. Uh, and, and her strategy to do that uh, really helped amplify her voice. Yeah, great. Thank you. I want to jump to Craig in case he freezes again. <laughs> Craig, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry, folks. We went, we did a, uh, a dress rehearsal and mm -hmm. things worked very well, but um, hopefully Craig will come back and we'll have a chance to, to hear what he has to say. Ellen, did you want to build on that and on Kyle's response in any way? No, that was good. Thank you. Yeah. I thought she was very, very good at networking and, and that is key to anybody that is, is really working on, on any issue um, is to build your network of people and in, in, in a wide variety of stakeholders. Yeah, and, and I guess I would add to that is what, what I also appreciated was how much she looked to learn from others and incorporate that. And then also others learned from, you know, what we started to incorporate here in Pennsylvania. So going to Germany and going up to Massachusetts and seeing what was working, I think, was is a really key, key point and, and really moved and progressed Pennsylvania with that ability for her to partner and, and reach outside. And I think that's key to any future program or future work. So. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, as we're talking about future programs and future work, you know, what do you think some of the, the biggest challenges facing um, forest preservation today are? You know, Myra was working at a time when they were rebuilding the forest because they had been cut down because of the, the tremendous need for timber. But what are some of the, the pressures on forest and land conservation today? Who wants to go first? Kyle? Me? You? Whoever. Ellen, right. let's go with you this time. Okay, we'll jump in. Well, I mean, there's a lot there. So clearly we've got a lot of the um, stressors coming from, uh, you know, either all of the invasive pests and you know the changes that we're seeing in the forest. So that is a lot of, of effect and impact. And of course, anytime you're losing the forest um, when it's being converted to another use. And, th and that's a lot of our effort is to keep, keep forest forests and decrease that opportunity for it to be impacted. Um, and one of the things that has been nice, at least in the in the coming or in the recent years is the understanding of the value of trees and the value of forests and how important they are in restoration, which is exactly what she was talking about a hundred years ago. But um, so for example, one of the big projects or at least efforts that we're part of is the Chesapeake Bay program. And it seems pretty similar to, you know, the work that she was doing in repairing these watersheds that, you know, have those high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. And what does that, which is, you know, trees and forests and planning these riparian buffers. So I feel like, you know, the issues are just going to change, but those values that the forests and trees bring are going to be the same and we're kind of continuing it. And, you know, we might have something else in another hundred years. Um, but for now, a lot of, a lot of our work is around that watershed protection and keeping, keeping those resources nice and clean, or at least um, planting trees. We have a tree vitalized grant program 
um, planting trees in communities and in urban areas where you can really feel the value of either sh uh, shading or, you know, all those things. So anyway, there's, there's a lot that, that the, the trees in the forest can bring to uh, benefiting those environmental impacts. Um, but yeah, I would say, sorry, getting back to your question was a lot of those invasive and, and degradation of the forest. And then of course, losing the forest to some, some other use. Okay. Yeah. And one, one of the things I think people are, are recognizing now is that, um, you know, forests are great places to go to, to relax and calm down. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of people going out into our parks and forests during this time of COVID-19, you know, to, for their physical, mental, and emotional health and to de-stress. So Kyle, I want to turn it over to you to, if you had a response to the question as well. Um, yeah, I think Ellen covered a lot of it. Um, and of course, you know, one of the biggest challenges as always is funding, um, you know, funding not only to protect and enhance uh, the parks that we have that are currently open to the public. Um, as most people know, Pennsylvania has one of the best public lands infrastructures in the country. Um, we're also uh, very lucky here in that we almost all our parks and forests, uh, you know, you can go visit them for free. It doesn't cost you a dime to to go out for a hike, um, but all that does take funding to maintain and be open for uh, folks to go out and enjoy. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, in some parts of the state, there's certainly, uh, you know, a conversion issue. Um, and I think in uh, other parts of the state, it's really keeping large contiguous forests as uh, large contiguous forests that are some of the best uh, ways that we have to help filter stormwater and do flood control. Uh, and more and more, I think the uh, it's very apparent that um, practicing smart and sustainable forestry is better for uh, both the bottom line for privately held forests um, and also better for conservation. And so I think we are in sort of an era of uh, conservationism now where um, really the, the market forces are beneficial to conservation. And um, you know, as large private forest owners or, or small private forest landowners um, can practice good conservation um, and also see a great uh, return and a good business as well. Great, thank you, Kyle. I'm just gonna check back with Craig to see if he's able to join us. Craig, are you able to, do you have sound? You still don't have sound. I see Beth, can she help? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Try again. We'll come back to you. I have two questions from the uh, the site here. One one is um, somebody's asking if the house on Front and Riley, where the marker is, is her original house. And I do know that the, that the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission marker is is right by her house, but I'm not sure exactly which one it is. Um, another question with is would Myra's strategy of getting in front of the right people work today with the conservation cutting bills being proposed? Um, yeah, I mean, the strategy of, um, you know, providing information and forming partnerships and, um, you know, it, it sounds like maybe it would. I mean, she certainly, Providing the information of the importance of forests is is a key part, and sh that was a large portion of her work. And you know, the 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 best thing that we can do is is make sure that folks understand those values and work to um, help facilitate that. So I think you know that that's that's all of our goals is is making sure that we pass that information on and we have those conversations and build those relationships to be able to do that. You know, and if and if issues affecting our parks and forests are of interest to you, you know, please do follow us, the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation, on, on our Facebook page because we are monitoring some legislation now, and we'll provide links and information. Um, another question is, um, what do you think Myra Lloyd Dock would say about the challenges we face relative to climate change, and what role do you think she would push as the role of the Forest Service in combating climate change and carbon sequestration in particular? Yeah, uh, well, go ahead. No? 
<laughs> she, yes. I mean, I would say that she would be all over that. Uh, and I think, um, I think that legacy of, of, her concern with the environmental impacts that were going on in the urban centers, or then, you know, what you were seeing up in the up in the north central forest. I mean, that was a large part of her work, and I think she would be digging in right now, just as we are, and and making sure that we get the word out about the values of trees and and forests, and you know, limiting those impacts. So, um, you know, we have a climate change adaptation and mitigation plan that we're working through, and and um, and you know, applying in, in many different ways, from forestry to we also manage native wild plants to you know our parks infrastructure and things like that. So, I think she would definitely be just digging in and and working to probably increase forests across the state, it's just the same as she was. Yeah, and doing it all in a skirt, high heels, and a fancy yeah. hat. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, going back to the question of um, also showing the value of the forest, the, the other piece that was really important was how she tied the urban or community to the larger forested areas as well. You know, we know that a lot of people learn about the about the forest just from that one tree or two trees in their backyard. And so, um, you know, making those connections to that one tree or that one plant that you're interested in and tying it to the importance of that forest that can provide a lifetime of, of uh, benefits. I think that's a key piece and making those ties to those small, small things that people can kind of catch on to and understand about the value of trees, be it wildlife or that it's shading and reducing my energy costs or whatever it is, um, keeping my streams clean, um, making those ties to those bigger values of the forest. And, and I think that's where, you know, she was valuable and could be making those same, um, making that same, same headway today. So I, I liked her connection even then. Yeah, she was a re remarkable woman. Kyle, did you want to respond to the question uh, in relation to climate change and carbon sequestration? I think Ellen nailed it. I mean, yeah, Myra would be uh, all on board and pushing for this. Uh, you know, one of our best tools in combating climate change is large, healthy forests um, and all of the benefits that go along uh, with those. Uh, they're really our, one of our best tools we have right now. At the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation, we like to call the trees the panacea for everything because they really have so many different functions. And we've actually, this year, this year that we're celebrating Earth, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, we've declared uh, this year the year of the tree. And we have a lot of information relating to the value of tree. And every Tuesday, we have information on our social media channels um, talking about the different functions and values and um, this past Tuesday, we had a uh, presenter talk about, um, there's this year of the tree, um, how to properly plant a tree because you, you had mentioned, Ellen, it, you know, it could be that just the tree in your backyard could make a difference and that could also connect you to the forest and maybe inspire you to get out and um, look at the, big, the larger landscape. There was a question earlier. Um, I'm hoping that Craig comes back on. Craig's having, Craig, try again, unmute yourself. You're muted. Hello. Awesome. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. Go, so, go. Talk about so, Myra's legacy. Well, first start off with, I've been teaching online since March 10th. You think I would know how to do this, but I do live <laughs> and it's, uh, I don't get very good internet. So I have to go back to Penn State Mont Alto, the first formerly the Forest Academy, to, to teach my online classes. So uh, I've known about Myra since I started teaching there in 1993. Um, she's, she is the mother of forestry in Pennsylvania. And that legacy, knowing that I work at a place that, that has that history has been really fun and, and rewarding. To know that our campus is an arboretum and she grew a lot of those firs and spruces, the Nico fir and, a, and Korean fir from, from seed from around 1905. And 
So she's uh, been an inspiration just knowing that she was the, the mother of forestry and taught some of the same type students that, that I teach now. And do, do, you, do you teach about Myra to your students? Yeah, I have, uh, I have her, her card. <laughs> All right. No, she, she, uh, we've had the, the author of the book come to school and talk about her we had with our forestry club. And so students are, are definitely aware of her and, and JT Rothrock. Marvelous. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit about why we thought maybe Myra had such an influence. Do you have any, any insight that you'd like to share? Why do you think that she was able to influence so many people and make such a difference both in the city of Harrisburg and in preserving our, our forest and creating this amazing system of forests that we have today? Yeah, you know, not knowing her personally, but just from reading uh, her passion and honesty and just being very, her sincerity, her interest. And uh, looking at, she is a very humble person from what I've read. Back in 1927, they wanted, they put two, two posts uh, next to the bridge on our campus. And they wanted to put bronze plaques for Joseph Rothrock and for her. And she said, no, I don't want that. So there was only one brass plaque. So her, how humble she was and, and how she cared for people, cared for the students. And I, just people saw that and listened to her. I read that she is just a very good speaker. In fact, uh, she was a lecturer at Mon Alto uh, in botany and it wasn't part of their normal classes. So she spoke every Friday night at a, was what was called the Log Lodge in Mon Alto Park. And it was outside of their classes Friday evening and it was considered by the director of the, at the time to be a distraction, something new. So can you imagine students having school all week and then go see somebody lecture Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> but, so she, her sincerity is what really impresses me. Yeah, I often think if, you know, you could, sometimes you ask the question, if you could sit down and have lunch with one person, who would it be? And, and Meyer is often a person that I think that I would love to sit down and have lunch and just to, to hear her speak. Um, we had a question, uh, what are the various uses of Pennsylvania's forests? Um, parks, water management, air quality management. Um, how else are Pennsylvania's forests used? What is their role? So I, I see there that uh, Karen mentioned, you know, paper pulp and timber, and um, you know, Ellen probably has a lot of details on this more than more than I do. But um, you know, Pennsylvania is the largest producer of hardwoods in the entire country, uh, so it is a major economic engine uh, for the state, not just for all of the ancillary benefits of water management and recreation, um, but it's really a, a key driver in our economy. Um, and the, all those products, forest products, um, really can be harvested and uh, done in a sustainable manner that's good for the environment and, and great for the industry. Well. Ellen, did yeah, you want to agree? Well, he said it very well. I would just be re repeating, but yes, there's there's many many uses and values from pulp to hardwoods to um, you know, trails to water trails, um, you know, fishing. There, it, it, there are so many uses and values of the forest. It is pretty impressive how many different things you can manage for with there, or at least um, place the value. Craig, did you want to add anything? No, I think I'd be repeating what Kyle said and Alan. Uh, you know, I teach sustainable forestry, and I, and that's what uh, Myra Lloyd Dock talked early about forest conservation, and probably even potentially before you know Gifford Pinchot talked about it. Uh, so again, she was talking about the same things 
then that are so important now. Yeah. You, you might, when you're not speaking, you may want to mute your mic because we were getting some weird feedback there a few minutes ago. Um, Ellen, did you, was there something else you wanted to add? I don't, I don't think so. I'm good. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because when the narrator went into a, a fair amount of detail about um, Myra's childhood and you hear from a, when you're looking at the conservation heritage of, of a lot of our, our leaders that they developed a connection to the outdoors at a very early age. Mm -hmm. um, so what role do you think connecting children to the outdoors plays in cultivating our future conservationists? Alan, we'll start with you because you're it's, unmuted. It's huge. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I grew up first. We had an orchard, so I grew up caring for, you know, it was a small orchard, 25 acres of of uh, my little forest. And so that was a lot of, of learning how to care for the land. And then we lived along the Conodogwinnet Creek and boy, I was I was in the creek fishing and digging up rocks and crayfish. And, um, you know, it 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 certainly does play a lot and I think if if you you don't experience what it's like to sit in that quiet of the forest or hear the creek um, kind of rippling by or watch the heron fly out every morning when you come outside um, you know those those experiences certainly build that appreciation of those resources and and you know to me it's extremely important and and I think even going back to the urban community, because not everybody can go out into the middle of the forest. Um, if we can if we can bring in that experience in their backyard or in the park or behind the school or whatever it is, if they can, they can grasp an understanding of that value or the importance of it, even there, then, you know, we're doing a good job. Because, you know, outdoor experience is very different in inner city, you know, Philly compared to you know, up in the middle of the North Central, but. Great, we had a comment, uh, education is key, project learning tree. <laughs> yes, I think, I think we know who yeah. posted that. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, what, we, how would, what would you like to add in terms of yeah. connecting children to the outdoors? It, it's essential. Uh, I'm gonna quote a, the first forestry school in America, the Biltmore Forest School. Take the kids to the forest. It's a far better classroom than any made out of brick. So, you know, that's what I enjoy, taking students to the forest and spending a lot of time there. But even at, it seems like the students that I teach now, who, when you ask, why did you come to forestry school? Who, I like the outdoors. I like to fish. I like to hunt. I like to hike. I like to bike. And it, it all starts at, you know, the earliest age. So critical. It's very critical. Kyle, you're, you're a father. Do you want to? <laughs> you have yeah, a young I, budding conservationist at home. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Yeah. And, um, you know, say echo what uh, Craig and Ellen have said. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of joy um, that you can get, you know, as a parent or as, as anyone spending time around uh, watching young kids in nature, whether that's, um, you know, say out in the middle of nowhere or, um, you know, here Harrisburg Greenbelt along the Paxton Creek, which um, you know, kids can walk to from their, their houses. Uh, there really is just sort of an unbridled joy and freedom there. Um, and I think that's what a lot of folks sort of harken back to when they say, I love the outdoors, you know, it's that connection that they feel at a young age. Um, but we also, I think, have to recognize that not everyone has had that kind of childhood or, or had that opportunity uh, when they were young. And that uh, we're also, you know, now seeing all of the other benefits, or at least really, I think, having the scientific background uh, to show that um, nat all the natural stormwater uh, features that we can have to help uh, flooding. And I think there's a, a sort of a whole new way to, to connect people that may not see the outdoors as uh, recreation, um, that may not have grown up fishing or hunting or hiking, uh, to see conservation and the protection of natural spaces as uh, a cost-efficient way to stop their neighborhood from flooding. 
Uh, and I think that there's a, another sort of key education piece there as well that may be more geared towards uh, you know, adults and, and uh, older kids, uh, that's, that's a, a sort of a, a component that uh, we should be looking at as well. Great. Well, that kind of ties into to a question that was posed earlier and just was um, asked again is, you know, how do we bring conservation history into education? How do we bring more environmental education into education? Um, you know, we, we had it, ecology and environmental standards at one point, I think they're, they're being, um, modified as we speak, but how do we get some of these, how do we connect people to these, these key figures, these, these pieces of history, Pennsylvania often is referred to as the cradle of conservation. How do we connect students to understand their history, um, so that that might inform future decisions? Oops, I, I thought my dog was coming into the to the room, and there was a request for her on the sidebar. Uh, so, Craig, do you want to talk, uh, talk about that? Uh, yeah, projects like Project Learning Trade, just getting young people outdoors, and maybe having one of the stations could be involved with uh, showing that that conservation history. History is a tough subject to teach to to young people. But in uh, tying that in with outdoor activities could be potential one solution that I can think of. Great, Kyle or Ellen, do you want to? I wish I had an easy answer to that question, uh, but I'm not sure there is one. Uh, you know, an easy answer, but I think it is critical and it's really important um, to have it as along with. Um, the basic curriculum that you have uh, in our schools, whether that be in you know public school, private school, um, and in secondary education as well. Uh, particularly, I think in Pennsylvania, uh, from a, a connection to place and understanding uh, your own history um, and understanding Pennsylvania's and Pennsylvanians' role uh, in the the conservation movement, uh, I think is is really important, and it would help build that connection uh, for people from an academic side, as well as from an emotional connection uh, to the land. Great. And um, just the only thing to add to what Kyle and Craig had already said um, is there's also examples of some schools or at least teachers that are doing some really neat stuff that we could build on and try and um, get the word out to other teachers and other schools. You know, we've been working with some schools on tree plantings and gosh, once they get out there and do some tree plantings and, and, you know, they may have years before they see the results, but you know, many will come back and see like, Hey, I planted that. But what are those examples of those positive experiences that we can build in and, and take some examples and, and push them forward? I think that's another opportunity as well, because there's some neat stuff going on that you just want to, you know, sprinkle around to all the other schools as well. Yeah, help. You know, how do we spread that? Sprinkle yeah. That. Well, yeah, that's that's a key. Yeah, Craig, you look like you want you're 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 on mute, Craig. If you wanted to add something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I th I forgot to mention the Envirothon. That's a very important. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. International program teaching young people about you know wildlife and fisheries and water and and forestry so that's a some more support for the Envirothon would be good too yeah great what we're we're, we're running over time but so i wanted to to open it up to each of you to um, wrap up with any last thoughts that you have um on my Lloyd doc and her legacy or what people can do to to get engaged and um um, in conservation in, in Pennsylvania. So, Craig, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, since uh, I haven't been on for half of the time, <laughs> I don't know, she's, she's always been a hero. She, a heroine, she's, uh, you know, followed a passion. And I, I think that's very important for people to pick something that they 
find important and just push for it. An earlier question was what would she have done with uh, climate change? She would have jumped right on that and, and been lecturing about that all across the state instead of forest conservation or, or beautification and, and this, uh, in Harrisburg, the greenways. So I think it's following her lead and, and following your passion and, and just getting the word out there. Great. And they can apply to become a, uh, a uh, forestry student at, at Mon Alto. Sure, sure. Yes. <laughs> Any age, Great. yes. Yes, yes. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Ellen. Well, uh, yeah, so uh, as far as getting involved, you know, um, we have many opportunities to get folks involved, be it from, you know, the conservation volunteers that are working at the nursery or coming and experiencing uh, some environmental ed pieces at parks, or um, we also have a youth core program where students either in high school or then we have an adult crew where they can come and learn what it's like to work in natural resources in parks and forestry and 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 have some sort of bridge between high school and, and college. And, you know, we have some that <clears throat> have never taken courses in natural resources and they go through this program and, you know, they've decided they want to be in forestry or parks, environmental ed, or something like that. So there's a lot of opportunities and, and certainly we we have have opportunities to get our message out more. Um, you know, so so that we would welcome any any folks to be part of these programs or tree plantings and, and all that. And I think going back to Myra, I mean, that's how she got her message out was through talking about things and being incorporated into the community. And, and, you know, if there are ways that we can make more ties to be able to do that, then, you know, we're all ears. Um, and so we would love folks to um, participate and, and help spread that message. Um, and before I forget, and before we uh, move on to Kyle, is I also wanted to give a huge thank you to the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation and your volunteers, because um, PPFF over the past few weeks made something like almost a thousand nine hundred or and seventy or something like that masks for our parks and forestry staff who are working through you know this COVID nineteen stay at home uh, time frame and I mean that nine hundred and seventy is just crazy to me so you know, you guys are a kind, giving, caring, dedicated bunch. And so, you know, a big, huge thank you from DCNR for that. I mean, that was amazing. That's You're quite amazing. welcome. That made all of us feel good. So, you know, uh, we, we really appreciate it. And that just shows, you know, PPFF and, and the folks involved with PPFF are, are just wonderful. So thank you. You're quite welcome. We have some amazing volunteers and they were very happy to to support the places they love and the people that yeah. care for them. It was great. Yes. Kyle. All right. Uh, well, great job, uh, Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation and your volunteers. Uh, that is awesome to hear. And thanks for putting this on tonight. Uh, I'd say go out and tell some friends about Myra Lloyd Doc. Maybe not go out, but send them an email. <laughs> um, you know, spread the spread what you learned here tonight to folks that maybe don't know about Myra, um, and look for more of the unsung heroes of this movement and, and others um, to to tell their story. Um, as far as I know, we're also still allowed to hug trees, so get outside, sure. enjoy the forests. Um, you know, enjoy the parks. And, uh, you know, enjoy the legacy that uh, is available to you as a um, resident or visitor here in Pennsylvania. Um, get out there and, and enjoy it. Great. Well, thank you, Kyle, Craig, and Ellen. You are amazing. Uh, your insight is, is very valuable, and we appreciate you sharing your time with us here this evening. If you are interested in learning more about conservation heritage, you can visit the PA Conservation Heritage Dot org website. There are other documentaries there as well as stories. 
I can't say that we've captured every story. So if there, you see that there is something that's missing, please drop us a line and say, hey, here's an important person, place, or event that we need to capture. Um, this viewing will remain on the Pennsylvania Parks and Forest Foundation's Facebook page and YouTube channel. So feel free to point it out to others. And if we didn't get to your question tonight in the chat box or um, through the panelists, we'll be sure to try to make a comment um, in the comment section of our Facebook page, though we don't want to leave any of you hanging. So thank you again, presenters. You did an amazing job. We really appreciate you being here with us. And thank you all the viewers and people posting questions. It was wonderful to spend the evening with you. And um, everybody, thumbs up to Myra Lloyd Doc, an amazing woman. And um, we appreciate all that she did for us and we benefit from it today. So have a great evening, evening everybody. Okay. Have a panelists, if you can stay on um, as we we end, uh, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you.